So welcome to uh, this talk, Feeling Photography, and it is my great honor to introduce you all to Professor Adela Licona. Professor Licona is Associate Professor of English and the Interim Director of the Institute for LGBT Studies at the University of Arizona. And these positions really seem to locate Professor Licona in particular disciplines, but when you examine her work, when you examine the stuff she does, it really becomes evident that she embodies mestizaje. She embodies this in her approach to scholarly and activist work, drawing from rhetoric, performance studies, queer, feminist, gender studies, and putting these fields in conversation with geography, environmental studies, and Chicana and Latino studies. Uh, Professor Licona's research is refreshingly border crossing and in so being is resistant to location and to silo. This resistance to placement is examined in the themes of her writing and her creations. Specifically, she examines the way groups on the margins, such as feminist and queer of color, queers of color, gender nonconforming youth, and immigrant communities use various innovative and resistant modes of expression to articulate their modes of knowing in a world that doesn't often see or recognize them. Professor Licona shows how these creations enable connection and coalition, possibility and potentiality, rupture and resistance. In effect, Professor Licona examines how people on the margins make worlds with the intent to change those worlds. This world and change making is evident in her 2012 book with SUNY Press entitled Zines in the Third Space, Radical Cooperation and Borderlands Rhetoric, in this, Professor Licona examines feminist and queer of color zinesters use of borderland rhetoric to disrupt and create new cultural, political, economic, and sexual configurations. This happens primarily through the coalitional possibilities that these zinesters cultivate, allowing readers whose lives are also constituted by borderland experiences to find connection, new language, and meaning, and possibilities in a world that often pushes them further to the periphery. Her work has also examined how Latino immigrants, especially those in the U.S. heartland in the Midwest, feel both compelled as well as erased by experiences of Latinidad. In essays published in Antipode, Noises, the Annals of the Association of American Geographers, as well as many others, Professor Licona illuminates the both neither negotiation for Latino communities in the United States. Her analyses in these projects offer more nuanced attention to the doubleness and the neitherness as we think about and theorize identity construction and experience. So yesterday she shared works uh, around the idea of the non-image and the centrality of visual logics and the regimes of distortion that are really uh, perpetuated through these non-image circulations. And in today, what uh, the work is going to do is to build on that, to offer hopefully an alternative to those regimes of distortion. And I think what's so helpful about her engagement with the non-image is that Professor Nikona herself is a photographer and a, cinema, a cinematographer. She's a practicer of images. She uses films and uh, photography to explore constraints and possibilities around world making. And she has a fantastic website with many of her photo uh, uh, photography exhibits and, and pieces. It's called mividalandscapes.blogspot.com and I'm sure she'll share that with you all. And <coughs> In addition to this sort of creative work, this performance work that we're going to see today, her uh, work also does, uh, fo is focused on activist and change-making, policy change-making aims. And there are many examples, but I wanted to cue us into one that we're going to learn about tomorrow in the workshop. Um, so Professor Licona was a part of a collaborative project that documented the experiences of gender non-conforming youth of color in schools. And in addition to publishing for academic audiences, the team developed infographics to address the ways gender nonconforming youth of color are channeled into the prison to school pipeline. These infographics have been influential. They were picked up by national and international media. They were the basis of an MTV documentary. And the reports have been read by thousands and now inform policy making around gender nonconformity um, in states around the country. 
So I'm very excited to talk with you about those infographics tomorrow. And I'm also very happy to be welcoming Professor Licona to UW-Madison. I think um, over the course of this session, we're going to learn much about how to do creative, collaborative work that has practical impact, that builds connections, and that really is working to set conditions for possibilities and world making. So please help me uh, welcome Professor Licona. <laughs> It, it worked the second time around, it worked. I need to pocket Sarah with me at all times. Um, you know, I, I'm thrilled to be here, so thank you for that really warm welcome. And I said yesterday that, um, I, mean, I don't think I said this part, but as a first generation uh, student, my uh, visions of what university would be, could be, were what I understand the Haven Center to be. And when I uh, received the invitation and was invited particularly to, to um, share works in progress, I, I was delighted and, and I remain that way. Um, and today you're going to get a, a work in progress. And for, um, I was about to single out the graduate students and, and I, maybe I don't need to, maybe this is for all of us. But it, I mean, it clearly is for me. I'm gonna start this presentation with the frameworks uh, through which I, I started thinking about um, what this uh, project's all about. And I'll end with where I am today with it. It's not the same, though it complements, I think, one another, and it, it comes together in, in uh, ways that have been generative for me. But I thought if I did that, I could sort of model for you um, what it feels like, looks like, sounds like to, to start and to rethink and to begin again in a project and to um, take some things back and out of the equation and put some new things in. So that's, that's what you're sort of in for. And um, so there's some formal setting of the stage and then there's the piece that is somewhat performative. It's not my, my usual mode and of presentation, so that's sort of experimental for me. And it, me it means to bring um, uncertainties uh, before you um, and present them as uncertainties. Um, and then the last part, again, is just where I am now with my thinking with regard to um, the regime of distortion and maybe using distortion um, uh, purposefully and against itself uh, in, in different ways. So that's, that's sort of in a nutshell. Um, so I thank once again uh, Karma Chavez who uh, reached out to me early on about uh, visiting and Patrick for following up and, and hosting me um, and Sarah for the warm welcome and the students you've been great. It's been such a, a generative uh, time for me speaking with all of you. So thank you. I don't want to miss the opportunity to thank uh, the laborers who prepare this room um, so that we can come together and in comfort and uh, in organized ways to um, enjoy one another's conversation, I hope. So thanks goes to them. I'm grateful. So. All right. My presentation today is a transdisciplinary collaborative work in progress. First, it calls on queer methodologies that consider the never singular process of production. Colleagues working with me on this project or ideas circulating herein have informed this presentation. In other words, while the ideas I bring are those I've been working on for some time, um, they also bear the traces of generous colleagues and graduate students who've explicitly collaborated or otherwise been in conversation with me regarding these still uh, brewing ideas. So I thank most especially Ava Hayward, who's in a way here with me at the presentation, as well as Frank Galarte, Jamie Lee, and Ethna Lubade. Second, the presentation introduces concepts that I'm bringing together as I continue to think through the idea of both images and non-images um, as arguments with moving and mobilizing possibilities. Third, through a multimodal and creative sort of performance presentation, I'm going to introduce digital images that I've produced creatively um, to reconsider, um, rather to consider if and how such moving and mobilizing possibilities um, can be revealed in the relationship between images and action, and some, some stuff in between. So um, I'm going to start with these questions then. Is it in the possibility of another look where moving and mobilizing possibilities take shape? How might multimodal production inspire and further inform another look? Finally, how might another look function to expose and resist the regime of distortion within which images are presently produced and circulating in the service of a particular social order. 
I'm going to end um, with thoughts still coming together around the concepts of what I term wild refractions and queer visuality, um, and more questions still. I deeply appreciate, as I've said, the Haven Center um, invitation to bring work in progress to this space. It's such a generative opportunity and a really great way, I think, to think out loud um, together and to risk that out loudness of the unfinished. So again, I'm, I'm so thankful that you're here um, to help me think through these ideas. Um, I'd like to briefly introduce key terms that I call on in today's presentation, and they, they're pretty much the same as yesterday's key, key terms. I've, I've added um, the feeling photography that you'll see in a moment, but for those of you who weren't here, regime of distortion is a concept that I'm proposing as part of the disciplining apparatus that produces the structured and structuring logics um, of the given to be seen as a functional distortion predicated on obfuscations and erasures. The given to be seen, informed here by Kaya Silverman's work, is a concept that suggests that practices of looking are disciplined to produce an uncritical and normative and normativizing gaze. Visual argument is um, simply the idea that an image can constitute an argument, and I think it can. Feeling photography is the affective experience of looking at and seeing, experiencing photography that includes the haptic and the sensate, and that together might open up critical and creative modalities and their moving possibilities and mobilizing potentials. Moving from yesterday's presentation then, um, my focus is on the image as argument and relatedly on whether and how um, viewers of an image can be moved from the spectacle to action. Um, here I'm thinking again of J. Anthony Blair, um, who returns to Aristotle's notion of the enthymeme as the unstated premise or taken for granted assumption that can be and is left out of an argument. An enthymeme depends on the audience filling in the omitted premise according to prevailing norms and the emotional intensities that produce and sustain them. And that's really an important part of what I'm, I'm doing, um, is, is thinking of those uh, uh, emotional intensities, particularly within what I've called the regime of distortion. In such a regime, the given to be seen produces and is produced by the structuring and um, structured and structuring, or rather, distorting and distorted gaze that's delimited by hegemonic norms. Related distortions are secured by fears and suspicion, what I've called elsewhere monstrous rhetorics, that serve the unstated premise of, of an argument and that limit the possibilities for ways of looking and seeing. I'm after what it takes for viewers to reconsider the given uh, to be seen, to look again, another look. Another look may be the first step, but what then might produce engagements with these everyday image texts that might move people to action? And what, beyond the visual, might inspire and inform that other look? I'm considering again whether and how the rhetorical force and function of images as multimodal productions and through sensate engagements can be more than and can also trouble the given to be seen, especially as the engagements I'm proposing refuse conceptual closure. In their article, Image Events, the Public Sphere and Argumentative Practice, the Case of Radical um, Environmental Groups, John Delacath and Kevin uh, DeLuca consider image events visual arguments. While their focus is on image events as explicitly staged protests designed by activist groups for media circulation, I want to shift the focus to everyday image events, so a different scale, if you will, as also importantly generative and possibly mobilizing. The image events that make the layered ecological violences, environmental racism, toxicities, and historic erasures of the settler state visible to us. I call on us as viewers. I call on expert authorized voices in this presentation, as well as on countercultural productions, to work with these visual images as I consider affective engagements and their possibilities. As you'll see, the photos I've produced are attentive to contradiction. My work on borderlands rhetorics as spatialized rhetorics of contradiction and ambiguity um, require a both and consciousness that require that inform my photographic work of everyday scapes, especially in my efforts to engage and present images as visual rhetorics that mean to trouble any singular interpretive uh, approach and instead expose multiplicity, radical openness, and necessarily calling for another look. 
This multiplicity that I'm working to expose is related to what I've termed a wild refractions of a queer visuality, which, as I suggested yesterday, can move us effectively beyond the, the delimitations of a dichotomous optic to engage specular and sensate multiplicity, and again, that radical openness that I'm looking for. These wild refractions are a kind of practice, uh, a, politics, uh, a, a politics of refusal, really, that um, refuse the given to be seen, and it's delimitations and devaluations that Lisa Cacho speaks about in um, her work. They call viewers instead to look and to see differently, um, to feel differently, and to be moved to do differently. Um, especially in contexts where dehumanizing images are consistently conjured and where the deemed human is understood or promoted as exclusively worthy. Drawn from my collections of photographs titled Mi Vida Landscapes as visuals <clears throat> that encourage, perhaps require, a sensate engagement, um, these images are meant to circulate as arguments that there's something more to feel, see, know, understand and remember, and importantly, there's something to do. Here, I'm called to Laura Mark's engagements with the ideas of distance senses, so vision and hearing, as well as with proximal senses, so touch, smell, and taste. So really, a sensate engagement um, that might include the discursive, the optic, the aural, the olfactual, the gustatory, the tactile, and the memorable. Such a sensate engagement is one that's predicated on more than one way of looking, seeing, experiencing, remembering, and feeling. In the remix that's required of words and images in my project, as well as of histories, different stories um, uh, can be told and erasures uh, can be exposed to offer possibilities. The possibility for a kind of revisioning, a counter memory making that, again, troubles that given to be seen. They mean to call viewers to review, look again, that which has been lost, actively erased, or otherwise compromised in and by historical or official records, other official records, and their roles in the regime of distortion. This is where I recognize the potential for decoloniality and a decolonial consciousness to inform new practices of looking and seeing. It is in the possibility for such work to maintain the focus um, that Leanne Simpson calls us to in understanding, quote, the lived experiences and histories of those individuals and communities that have and are still uh, living out decolonization, seeking to invigorate connections, struggles, and knowledges. So I'm working to capture the contradictions and multiplicities in these images that I'm about to share, that together with their related audio files, call for another, another look, another way of understanding, and they ask us to confront, they ask viewers to confront, be troubled by the exquisite in the grotesque and the grotesque in the exquisite. This both and production is neither simply sentimental nor sensational, but rather both sentimental and sensational. Whereas following Shelley Streeby, the sentimental mode tends to emphasize, quote, the refinement and transcendence of the body. The sensational mode dwells on the outrage done to bodies and often refuses the closure that sentimentality strives for, including a kind of reconciliation. No such reconciliation is intended in these photographs. In fact, as Streeby notes, the sentimental and the sensational can be understood as modalities on a continuum rather than as opposites. And that move is really important to, to all the work I'm doing right now, to sort of uh, move beyond and away from binaries that are, are closed systems, if you will. So it's both and rather than either or that together allow for the possibilities of shifting ways of seeing and looking that can guide viewers to sympathetic action rather than to what uh, Shelley Streeby calls the voyeuristic withdrawal into the spectacle, a space of distance and inaction. <laughs> the spectacle then is predicated on the distant senses of sight and sound and focused on the limited dimensions of the exterior. Laura Marx argues that erotics is the movement and moving away from distance and between distance and proximity. That's to say, that is to say between seeing, hearing, touching, smelling, tasting, and remembering. I wonder what Marx's concept of erotics might have to do with this other look that I'm interested in. Might it be the third space practice, a third space practice, that seems to ignite and regenerate a revved up sort of experience for the viewer, or um, that puts the viewer in a position of feeling the photography? 
Recording the outrage, this photography, as Strebe suggests, turns toward the sensational to provoke affect and emotional responses in viewers by foregrounding endangered, suffering, and dead bodies in order to make an argument about races, classes, nations, and thereby to expose erasures and to refuse closure in practice. I took these photos at the Salton Sea of the Imperial Valley of California for a series titled Matters of Scale, The Haunted Ecosystem of the Salton Sea. I use a Canon Digital uh, Rebel with a macro lens that allows me to capture contradiction that's rendered particularly accepts, accessible through the focused upon intimacies that they reveal. My analysis of, this, of these photos is informed by my ongoing collaboration with Ava Hayward. Here I'm drawing from our photo essay titled Trans Waters, Trans here is a moving mattering, a foregrounding, and this is quoting our, our article together, a foregrounding of political lines and possibilities and a refusal to dissolve contradictions in favor of recognizing coalitional modes of emergence as possibility. Our collaboration is intended to call attention to the ways environmental injustices play themselves out always unevenly on our human and more than human bodies to include bodies of water, bodies of spatio-temporal and cultural knowledges, and the earth. As we worked, we asked one another, the earth and, and in its, its inhabitants, and as we worked, we asked one another, how do we understand the mutual natures of ecological violences and modes of racism? And how are differently marked bodies and histories provide entry points into understanding and acting on ecological problems? Finally, we, we thought about how and where do we look and what do we look at again to more deeply understand, to know better and more, and to be moved to act. In our efforts to address these queries, we look together at these photographs, engaged in a kind of informal dialogic exchange. We called on colleagues and on authorized sciences, as well in, as on creative and historic literatures and uh, knowledges, as well, as well as on countercultural productions. I've taken these strands of knowledges and woven them for you here into the following multimodal presentation and performance of sorts as a queered production and explicit engagement with multiplicity to demonstrate and provoke the sensate engagement that I'm thinking and feeling my way through and proposing here before you. Audio accompanies the visual and the poetic performative is meant to puncture any singular as always too narrow interpretation. The Kalua Indians have inhabited the area from Borrego to Riverside for more than 2,000 years, an area of about 2,400 square miles. Today there are about 290 registered Kaluas as recorded by the tribal headquarters. According to Sapokinova, Bowardian Schlenk, the Salton Sea is the largest man-made lake in California and the largest continuous below sea level water body in North America. It, it was created in 1905 when what is recorded as, quote, an accidental breach of a canal temporarily diverted the Colorado River water into a natural depression below sea level. Since its accidental beginning, the Salton Sea was advertised as, quote, an environmental and recreational attraction in Southern California. It supported a major sport fishery that was a popular area for boater and other recreationalists. The Salton Sea provides daily wintering habitat uh, to four million birds. It is recorded as an accident, the accident of the Salton Sea, another contradiction. It was intended to feed, quench the thirst of the farming areas around it. Instead, they fed it poisons, pesticides, I close my eyes, recall Sheree Moraga's heroes and saints, I inhale the salt, feel it on my skin, too much, recall uh, Wakako Yamauchi's and the souls shall dance, I imagine Imperial Valley ghosts as dancing souls, doing the undoing dance, valley ghosts as dancing souls, desolation, the haunted poetics and performances of and beyond the Imperial Valley, the reach of empire, the makings and undoings of false promises, evidence in the stench of environmental degradation. I can smell the lies, deceptions and degradations, it stinks. 
dispossessions, dislocations, dis-ease, greed, ecological violences, environmental racism, the always limited, limiting promise of prosperity for some. I stand on covered over histories and the creation of an underground community of past humans and non-humans suffocated in too much water and salt. Humans still here, water and food injustice, invisible peoples still here, invisibilized, infected fish, dead fish, infected birds, dead birds, abundant flies, abundant birds, maggots, evaporites, silence, except for the buzz. Beautiful toxicity. That was supposed to be up when I read it. <laughs> the Neuritic to the Oceanic Pelagic and their subtending benthic zones, most of Blue Planet's life resides therein. The vast majority of its biomass is composed of organisms too infinitesimal for our primate eyes to see. Generally, zooplankton and phytoplankton, but specifically diatoms, dinoflagellates, radiolarians, and other minute biota. Seawater is also replete with microviruses, bacteria, and endless cycles of decay and regeneration. The ocean's fathoms are a rich protoplasm, a life-death life soup. The water formed nearly three billion years ago is still with us. These briny waters are pungent layers of time, pulsing temporalities that gather deep, deep histories, histories of ongoing exchange, intrachange, and interchange. I'm just going to go backwards to the... So Sapokinkova, the Wardian Schlink, report that the Salton Sea has historically received significant agri agrochemical input, including pesticides, utilized throughout the past several decades. The rivers that flow into the sea contain numerous pesticides, fertilizer, and industrial waste. Due to the elevated temperatures in the area, water evaporation increases salinity to 45 parts per thousand. Massive fish and bird die-offs, as well as eutrophication, are also commonly observed. From the Neuritic to the In 2015, it is already redundant to use the phrase environmental racism, because ecological crises are so often the result of genealogies of racism and are unequally experienced across racialized demographics. The disproportionate impact of environmental pollution in Arizona, for instance, is felt most by the poor, by Chicanos, Latinos, by migrants, and by native populations. The injustices associated with chemical runoff, clean water access, waste disposal, and resource development and use have turned questions about the environment into racial politics. But why then are so many environmental groups not talking about the racialization of ecological crises? It seems that the inability to address racism parallels the inability to attend to ecological crisis. The effect of this inability for some to pay attention because of ambivalence or disavowal, has made life unlivable for the majority on this planet. Perhaps instead of thinking of the Earth as only our mother, those with the means might do better to see that we have treated the Earth as an unwelcome guest, alienated, and that we have built a policed border between us and the Earth, turning the Earth into alienated labor that makes everything possible without planetary accountability. Those of us who've benefited the most from Earth alienating power might do well to see ourselves as hostile to our host and inhospitable to our fellow Earthlings. Flies flew into and out of my mouth, ears, eyes. It took hours to get them out of the car. The stench, the teeming bird life, 
the horrible, terrible beauty, the unseen botulism, avian botulism, invisible, hidden, deep, like trauma, trauma, the horror driven into bloodstreams like the plastics now swimming through so many of us, a violation, a penetration, I'm walking on scales, scales of injustice, evidence of the uneven burdens and atrocities of abundance. This was imagined as a recreational playground, beautiful, stinking death. I lick my lips and I taste salt, too much salt. Imagine eating salted flies. Is this what environmental racism feels like? Environmental and psychical trauma enacted over hundreds of years, years of colonization, settled, sedimented, not over, bleeding layers, the stench and flies circulating its histories now. The, pho the pho photograph holds beauty and trauma and moves us to question why we would even think of its beauty in such devastation. This contradiction calls me um, in from the distance, come closer, it says, look again, be moved, a new way of looking, uh, produced by and producing a new proximity. Is this the possibility I'm searching for? How might these images unsettle the ambivalence or refusal to see how race is at work in our lives, not singularly, not surprisingly, but always? I'm here to bear witness to the wretchedness, to remember other histories, living histories, silent and not so silent histories, histories abuzz, a beautiful inland sea, an imperial sea, empire, meant to mirror Palm Beach, where sandy beaches should be, I stand only on dead fish, no sand, thousands of dead fish, the salt and sink, salt and stink, and it's eerie. I moved to a closer look and I'm horrified, disgusted, but drawn in. At once, how to see differently, people still here, where, underneath, a nation, first peoples, submerged histories, under, over, overwritten histories, and too much salt, another accident of colonialism, settler colonialism, colonization as unfinished business. I'm called here to a decolonizing practice. Um, of creative and critical revisioning, informed by the fact that Leanne Simpson registers when she notes that indigenous peoples have lived through environmental collapse on local and regional levels since the beginning of colonialism. This is not new, she tells us, this is ongoing. I ask myself, what will it take to be idle no more? Dichlorodismethanin total PCB concentrations detected in sediment exceed probable effect levels established for freshwater ecosystems. Concentrations were higher than effect range median values developed for marine and estuarine sediments. In fish liver, concentrations of androin and PDDT exceeded threshold effect level established for invertebrates. PDDT concentrations detected in fish tissues were higher than threshold concentrations for the protection of wildlife consumers of aquatic biota. DDE concentrations in fish muscles tissues were above the 50 nanogram per gram concentration threshold for the protection of predatory birds. Pesticides, insecticides, and other chemicals varied from 6.15 to 9.5 nanogram per gram dry weight in sediments and from 6.1 to 80.3 nanogram per gram wet weight in fish tissues. Dieselfoden was found in relatively high concentrations in all organs from tilapia and corvina. I read that tilapia might survive here, but only maybe. Tilapia, birds, botulism, salt and pesticides, Ava's to toxic soup for the birds and those remaining. About tilapia, Orlando Delgado of Aquafina notes that ten, 10 years ago, no one had heard of it. Now everyone wants it, especially hospitals and schools, especially hospitals and schools, because it doesn't have a fishy taste. The water carrying these toxic histories and the dust that will be blown by the winds of uneven global development, another accident, bountiful, beautiful bacteria and algae blooms as noxious adornments in our lungs so pretty, earthquakes and toxins, more profound permeations into the earth with each tectonic shift and back out of the earth through evaporations and dust storms. 
reconfigurations, mutations. It was supposed to be a playground for the wealthy. But only those who could not get away remain. The fish and the birds too, and the flies and the algae, and the changing evaporating water, kissing the gleaming horizon, dead fish smells, rotting fish and flies and flying birds and ghosts, and some people I don't see in what's left of a resort that never was. She would tell me it was never meant to be, and still, like me, and like her, it is, in us, all of us, unequally so. This may consume is toxic dust. It may be creating a problem Southern California cannot live with, cannot live with, cannot live with. Following David Eng in his essay, The Feeling of Photography, The Feeling of Kinship, these images are an invitation to feel images as calls to new, perhaps even collective practices of looking as ways of seeing, feeling, and sensing with mobilizing possibilities, with a call to inquiry, to be moved, to experience these images as collections of contradictory, uh, contradictory stories so far. And there I, uh, I'm calling on the work of Doreen Massey, who offers that narrativized definition of space as a collection of stories so far that I find really compelling and helpful to my project. Haunted always by decay, erasures, racism, and other violences that are configured in and by settler states, and to imagine together what to do now and next. So here is what, um, where I want to introduce uh, where I am most recently in my ongoing search for new decolonizing practices of looking and seeing that might refuse the given to be seen of authorized and fear-inflected distortions that produce um, conditions of vulnerability, precarity, and as I argued yesterday, slow and social death. I turn to transnational women of color, third space, and indigenous feminisms, and the queer um, world-making possibilities their insights might inspire. And as I mentioned just a moment ago, also on feminist geographers, I call them. It's ever more urgent in the expanding regime of distortion to answer Ruby Tapia's call to illuminate the production of the invisible pictures or non-images produced in dominance and to look at the multiple interstices or spaces between production, circulation, and consumption of images and the cultivated practices of seeing and believing that produce them as real, as reality. To do so requires, following Lisa Cacho, an insistence on recognizing the multiplicity of, quote, material histories, social relations, and structural conditions, as well as on revisioning the relational interstices between assembled non-images, texts, dominant discourses, and related narratives, normativities, multimodal uh, media productions, and social imaginaries. That's what I hope my presentation today has started, um, even if still in a raw way. It's certainly uh, what I'm attempting, searching for other histories to complicate the hegemony of a singular ethno-normative historical record that can be taken into our repertoires of remembering to dislodge dominant normative narratives and the hegemonic perspectives they produce to affect new ways of looking and seeing. I recognize the need uh, for such new practices that can help us look, see, feel, and experience monstrous productions differently that allow us to critically interrogate the limits of the emergence and vanishing of the human at the limits of what we can know, what we can hear, and what we can sense. And that last part was um, Judith Butler's quote. Perhaps the task at hand is, as Butler proposes, to establish modes of public seeing and hearing, and I would add feeling, that might well respond to the cry of the human, and I would add the non-human, within the sphere of appearance, a sphere in which the trace of the cry has become, quote, hyperbolically inflated to ra rationalize a gluttonous nationalism or fully obliterated, where both alternatives turn out to be the same. Experiences of seeing and practices of looking, then, must not and cannot be reductive oppositional or homogenizing, but rather they must be linked to a progressive visual politics that, uh, through a third space borderlands framework, reject either or ocular logics. Perhaps such a politics, as Abraham Acosta argues in his article on Los Que Nunca Llegarán, is grounded, quote, in a principle of radical diversity and heterogeneity and the many and multiple facets of the human and the non-human. We must look, imagine, and feel otherwise relate otherwise in multiple directions to one another, to histories, and to place. 
Perhaps Samara Asmir's call to forge concrete alliances with human beings, and again, I add non-human others, who await not our recognition, but our participation in their struggles might help us not only to visualize, but to act on, as of yet, unimagined possibilities. I'm asking, I'm trying to answer what it might take to refuse that conceptual closure that I introduced yesterday that precludes more than one way of looking and enforces instead uh, specular logics that are predicated on false and limiting binaries. What does it take to shift from the singular to the multiple? Practices of looking, what Mirzoff might call the right to look, that re, uh, disrupt and revision the given to be seen, in this case of environmental crisis as always a racialized catastrophe of settler colonialism. Queer looking practices um, can refuse singularity, engage multiplicity, and can remain radically open. These have implications for the treatment of non-dominant and non-normative others in terms of bodies, bodies of knowledge, bodies of water, and bodies of land. My move to consider an affective and embodied experience of looking and seeing that rejects that singular interpretive frame and thereby unhinges, like queer politics do, specular logics predicated on those false and limiting binaries and refuses conceptual closure might thereby open moving, possibility, uh, moving and mobilizing possibilities. And here I want to extend Laura Marx's ideas regarding a sensate visuality to define and propose a queer visuality as wild refraction. To more fully consider that queer visuality, I move from my pre previous work on notions of what I called reverso and the refracted gaze of multiplicity as distinct from an inversion or an inverted and oppositional gaze to that politics of refusal that I've talked about, a kind of counter visuality that rejects images and imaginaries that delimit what can be seen and known, felt in the, in the face of a regime of distortion that sustains colonizing and neo-colonizing practices that in turn sustain historical erasures and refusals to see uh, and feel more complicatedly. I want to consider a politics of looking and seeing that, as Kaya Silverman would argue, take place at the threshold of the visible. And what Butler might imagine that function as, sensate, as participating in a sensate democracy. A politics of refraction must take place in the interstitial or third spaces between production, circulation, and consumption um, of non-images and images. In order to call attention to what has been made seemingly singular and static. This requires, too, reconsidering the relationship between the spectator and the spectated. I want to imagine relational practices of looking uh, that refuse only monstrous and terrorizing fictions, false dichotomy, the invisibilized, overlooked, unseen, objectified. A queer visuality and its wild refractions might include the affective and the erotic with particular attention to that which has been made seemingly inconsequential and or unworthy of life with implications for humans and non-humans alike. These same politics are predicated on relational looking practices as well as on the rejection of the sutured and especially the exceptionalized image. We have to be careful, I'm arguing, to avoid the pull to create exceptional subjects in order to transcend the good-bad dichotomy that's reinforced in the regime of distortion. Perhaps, following Lisa Cacho again, a queer visuality is related to a politics of deviance, as she calls it, which is itself about non-normative criteria for acknowledging that which has been concealed and congealed in a regime of distortion in order to recognize, reckon with, and see the parts that have been rendered invisible, monstrous, or otherwise dead to others. Thank you. I have a, a non-question. Oh, good. A non-question for the non-image. Good. Um, first to say, part of the I have no good question is that I'm absorbing so much here. This was amazing and wonderful and inspiring. Uh, Thank you. I wanted to reflect a little, though, on well, the not the non-image, the um, the present absence of indigeneity mm -hmm. in the piece. If you start there and it's there, and the indigenous peoples are there in the poetry, but they're also not there. Right. And I wondered if you could. Yes. Walk us through that picture that a little bit. And I, I do that on purpose. I know very little about the Gawila. I I came to know the Gawila through this project, and I thought that's what I'm hoping that this practice calls us to. And so I used the automated voice to suggest it's a voice that's not mine, of knowledges that I'm called to learn more about. Um, uh, and so 
uh, that that's that's what that's about. And it I mean to do that. I mean to say that shouldn't stop us. That should call us to more. Um, and I need to know more. So before this becomes more than a presentation and interaction, um, that's incumbent upon me. I'm called to know uh, a deeper knowledge. And there's I I uh, I first. The first interaction I had with the Salton Sea was around displacements of uh, Latino workers, Latino workers, um, in the in the fields, and the displacements that have gone on with uh, different mi migrant uh, injustice policies of injustice. I would say, so I, I came to know that land, and and those people are also erased from it, um, but I couldn't stop there, and so each each um, uncovering led me to a, a body of knowledge that I, I don't know, but that if I want to understand what's happening, I need to become conversant in. And so in, in a way, it's, it's meant to suggest that we cannot know it all, but we can inquire. And these practices should, should, should motivate us to do so. Um, and so the, the last, um, I started with Sheree Moraga's work, and then um, uh, Yamaguchi's work after that, because uh, Moraga's not writing about the Salton Sea in the Imperial Valley, but Yamaguchi is. And so each, each moved me, and then, you know, uh, that was about uh, uh, Japanese workers also displaced um, and interned. So there was just many, many histories, um, and the, the only one we get is as a continual recreational uh, 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 space with some problems. Um, so I hope that I mean yeah. long answer to say yeah I don't I don't know the, that <laughs> very well. Well, and then that comes it comes across in the use of that voice that there's a kind of not quite there yet. Yeah. Feeling to it. Yeah. So yeah, you're welcome. It's also the science. I mean, I could avoid trying to pronounce some of the words <laughs> that you know. I didn't want to. I also didn't want that to keep me from yeah. um, trying this out. And I thought those are the knowledges that we. Are intimidated by, or we don't value, and so they can it can operate in all kinds of ways, and yeah, yeah. Can you say uh, something about that? The portions that had to do with the with that voice that was generated, I mean, and what particularly you're getting at there? Because I said beforehand when you were testing it mm -hmm. that it sounded scary, and you said good. Yeah, well, um, I I think these are scary things, yeah. you know, um, and. So I wanted to use a kind of a disembodied voice, a robotic voice, um, a, a voice of both the future and the past in some ways, and one that um, is sterile in some ways because I'm I'm asking us to to um, maybe move through that to something else, and that uh, notion of the erotics, for example, is supposed to confront that um, that that voice that um, asks us not to be revved up about what we see. Um, and can be that voice of authority as well. So there's a lot that went into thinking about that voice in particular and, and using it. Um, and maybe that's all I have for now in terms of why I, I called on that voice in particular as I played with the different voices that could read that. Um, but so those, that's my answer for now. But it could change. But that's that's where I, I am with the voice. I leaped a little. And I interpreted it as something like, you know, art of the artificiality and then, you know, all this stuff about artificial intelligence and robots and mm -hmm. films and how this is, you know, we've created monsters. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I thought that's where you were going. Well, I do think, though, the automated voice, it's what I meant by the, the um, disembodied and authorized voice um, as something to fear in a way, the monstrous voice. So, yes. Um, but that's, those are, yeah, the, those were the thoughts in bringing the voice to the page. Um, but they definitely come after yesterday's talk, so they're related to the, the monstrous in that way. Mm -hmm. um, something to fear in a way, but something also to confront and not to um, let uh, prove uh, to be an obstacle, I guess, to knowing more. Scaring us away from multiple truths, I guess. You had a question. Yeah, I, so I was wondering, I was wondering about, the, so the, the look again, I'm really compelled by that, but then I'm also, as I was engaging in your, in your piece, there was a temporality with which I was engaging, and so I'm wondering about slowness mm -hmm. as, as a part of the, the practice that mm -hmm. you're, you're working with, and how temporality plays, plays into the look again, the, the, I don't know, the slow look came mm -hmm. up as a, yeah. I don't know. 
as I was looking and like seeing and seeing differently and questioning and and in my own experience of it oscillating between the spectacular and the grotesque, the mm -hmm. exquisite, you know, like some of those those elements. Yeah, I I honestly haven't thought about temporality in that way, though I think, <laughs> you know, another look requires and so I really like the idea of a slow look, but I think the slow look um, should be punctured with inquiry um, at, to know more, to understand what, what it is we're seeing, the, the, the knowing that we're always confronting contradictions in what we're looking at. Um, but in the same way that Doreen Massey, I think, calls us to look at space, at understanding always that it's not that flat terrain that we can frame and see there, but always is layered over um, multiple histories, and in this case, ecological violences. Um, and so that slow look is important, but there has, I think yeah. there needs to be yeah. something happening as well, action. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. So thank you for that. I like that concept. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned the word play um, right before you started the talk, and I wonder um, how play, like a serious play, like the kind of either putting together um, what we saw today, or just in your sort of writing, thinking mm -hmm. process. So, I, no, this is not a pun. I mean, I, I was being playful about, you know, Sarah as the, as the, as the performance scholar, um, and me as someone practicing a poetic voice in front of you all. And I shouldn't do that, I shouldn't do that, but I was. And, um, uh, but play does come up in my work, and um, in my work, particularly with Londi Martin and um, queer youth of color um, that we worked with on, on the streets, and how serious play was to them. And we came away with uh, a different understanding of play um, as something deeply generative, as critical, and in some instances as life, not just affirming, but saving. Um, a young woman who looked been on the street for money uh, when she was outed and, and kicked out of her home. And, you know, different, so we, we looked at play, but we also looked at play as a method of discovery and a way of presenting creating and presenting new knowledges, also calling on traditional knowledges and putting them, taking the risk, so a risk-taking practice of um, a multimodal, I guess, risk-taking practice that is productive. So thank you for that question. It, it, I guess it is at play here somewhat because um, I, I want to, to play across the modalities um, and the modalities of our senses and our sensual knowledges as well as the modalities of voice and production, audio and visual and photographics. Thank you. <coughs> yeah. I'm, I've been, uh, over the last two days, really struck by the way that you um, have approached visual argument, uh, an argument through the non-image, and uh, the directions that visual argument goes in here. Uh, feel very exciting and, and unfamiliar uh, compared to what I usually think of uh, mm -hmm. in terms of visual argument scholarship. And so I'm wondering if you could just say a little bit more about um, the way that, that uh, toward the end of, of this process or where you're at in this process, like visual argument uh, still bears relevance. Mm. Well, insofar as the visual can circulate in publics to um, to make an argument to move us. Um, I think that's that's still there. Yeah. But I'm I, I'm bringing together I think affect and queer um, studies as well as trans studies now to um, think more complicatedly still about um, the ways in which visuals circulate both in, in and through the regime of distortion and through distortions in turn responding to the regime of distortion. And so that also calls on immigration studies and the regime of distortion, um, and I talked a little bit more about this yesterday, is related to Nicolas de Genova's uh, regime of deportability. And the regime of deportability is a, a regime that is structured like in the United States um, to, to deport people, mass deportations, but it also functions at the level of threat. 
And so I'm interested in that, uh, in that as well, um, and how the regime of distortion, how suspicions are at play in a related way through the regime of distortion. And there was one more thing that I wanted to add to that. Um, I'll come back to it. I lost my train of thought. I'm sorry, but I, is that sort of does that get at what you were asking me? Yeah, I think I, I think um, you know that's that's a really key piece to this. Um, but also, there's that that methodological component, the performative per component that um, thinking about like how to do the second look, the continual look. Okay, so that was my the, what I thought I lost for a second. So I've in since I started. Um, when, I, when I entered the university, I was interested in what I now understand as third space, and that's sort of, uh, for me, a Chicano uh, way of, of understanding the world. And this this visual practice that I that I realize has also been delimited by false binaries, and that's what third space liberated me to understand. And I grew up in Juarez El Paso, and that's relevant because. Um, there was a river that ran through our community that w on the one side is the Rio Grande and on the other side is the Rio Bravo and still up ahead uh, the Raramuri have another name for it that I don't recall right now. Um, but I, I lived along a river with at least three names and they were all truthful, they were all real. But we don't, we don't usually understand that as we're growing up, we, we, that's not how we're taught. Um, in uh, dominant formal settings, I guess. And so I'm really sort of making a full circle back to where I started, but emphasizing now the visual and understanding, and Carolyn Merchant's work actually helped me understand this, the, the dominance of the visual um, and how, um, how oppressive the visual can be. Um, and so long answer to your question, but I hope that, that got to what you were getting to. Yeah, Krista. I have a, just the classic photography question. Mm -hmm. That question of whether photography moves to action is as old as photography. I itself. know. Um, <laughs> and I don't need or want you to rehearse the, mm -hmm. the canon of that discussion, but I would, I would love for you to talk a little bit about how you're moving us beyond the familiar terms of that. It seems like sensation is a huge part of it. Right. I guess in a way, Krista, I've... I've just left that argument behind <laughs> um, because I don't believe it exactly. I mean, I've, I, we're witnessing, right? I, I was really moved by if I die in police custody, um, that whole visual argument. Um, and so I, I know differently. And I don't know it in a scholarly way. And that's really what this presentation, and I, I became a photographer when my mother was dying in home hospice and I took care of her till her last breath. And what I did to keep myself grounded is photography. And then I continued to do it and realized, oh my goodness, if this is, this is um, sort of producing what I've always been wanting to, to be saying in some ways. So I, it's become such a central part of my work and uh, of work that I do now. I, I, I hesitate to call it professionally because um, whatever. I, I don't like those terms anyway, but I'm not a trained photographer, um, but I've spent hours behind the camera now. And I, I'm, I'm intrigued by young people, the work I've done with young people and their work through social media and uh, the, the visual as, as something. Um, and so I guess I don't, I, I, I don't have an answer to that age old argument, um, except that I, I don't think it's generative anymore mm -hmm. for me. And so I, I moved into the realm and maybe that's why I go to uh, the haptic and the affective and the queer and the trans um, and the, the intersectional approach. Yeah. yeah. Um, that question made me think about, I mean, for you it sounds like the practice of photography holds you to action. I wonder if it's, like, there's something about the practice of, I mean, for, for you, for anyone, about the practice of taking photographs that can be, can drive to action. Yeah, uh, some in yes and and more. Um, 
when I do my macro photography, I inevitably in sort of bringing them to, to the space in front of me to decide what I'm going to do with them, I see what I didn't see before. Mm -hmm. My vision isn't what it used to be yet. And I'm so close um, that it's in the second look that more is revealed to me. Mm -hmm. But that, that happened. I didn't, I wasn't looking for that to happen. Um, so that happened simultaneously with the movements, like if I die in police custody. I, mean, I was so moved by that um, project and political action, and I see it as action that that emerged as a result of the ways in which the regime of distortion always only sees terrorizing bodies in young bodies of color, young men of color, queers of color, poor people of color, working people, etc. And so that that those two things happened at the same time for me. Yeah. In your presentation, you talked a lot about taste and smell, and sort of smelling the ecological disaster. And those played into the other sensations um, that I was thinking about instead of the visual as the only sensation that I was thinking about. Um, does that have anything to do with, you've also talked about sort of collective viewing mm -hmm. and the possibilities for that, so I'm wondering how those other sensations might be happening in collective viewing that aren't happening with something in isolation, um, or how to bring those other sensations into the project. Well, so I'm teaching a course right now, a co-taught course with Manuel Munoz, who's a creative writer, a fiction writer. And it's um, called Cartographies of Desire, um, Latino texts and textualities, Latino texts and textualities. And we started the course in the Center for Creative Photography. Um, and we asked students to look at the, the works that we curated that we felt had a relationship to the works we would be reading. Um, and we asked them what they could taste mm -hmm. rather than what they saw. And then we asked them to look in a distorted way at a quadrant of the photo and then, you know, tell us the story of that photo. And so I'm trying to practice ways of teaching that, um, that produce the kind of looking that I'm interested in. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I know disgust is at play when we see a lot of the photographs that circulate right now um, that are of, uh, uh, well, uh, brutalized bodies. Um, and I think that actually that the senses are on high alert in, in the viewing, but I don't know. I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Um, but I think, I mean, I, when I see blood, I can taste blood. When, you know, I know what certain things smell like. And so, and I, I, that I, I don't know how to, how to uh, think further about that just yet, but I do think there's something there if we're being attentive to, um, the body and the more of the body. I think we could be making use of more ways of knowing them. 